Bom dia a todos meus irmãos e irmãs dos Estados Unidos. É um prazer abrir esse, essa conferência aqui. Estou falando em português porque um dos objetivos é trazer vozes do sul global e diversificar a cena dos psicodélicos e dar mais espaço para mulheres e latinos. Então, é um, uma bem-vinda em, em português. É. I know I got a Brazilian clapping for me. <laughs> okay, I just welcomed everybody in Portuguese and I said that one of the objectives of this uh, symposium is to bring voices from the global south and increase diversity and uh, different perspectives from women, from Latin people, from people from the south, from indigenous people. So that was a little symbolic opening. And I'm also going to ask everybody to stand up, and we're going to do Mexican protocol, which is standing up, please, everybody. <coughs> okay, uh, in name of CIIS and Chacruna, I welcome everybody and the, the works of this two days, this journey that we're going to be together is officially opened. I'm asking everybody to put their best of their hearts and their you know, intentions into this conversation, as they say here in the USA, this most, need, most needed conversation, remembering that we are all here to share you know, a bigger vision and remembering what unites us rather than what divides us, but also sharing our perspectives elegantly when we disagree. Welcome, and the, the works are started. Thank you. You can sit. So I, uh, I want to invite Diana Negrin, my colleague uh, from, from Mexico and US, and she's going to be the, the panelist for the first day. Just want to remind all of you uh, an apology that we announced live streaming, but we had last minute uh, technical problems, uh, and um, we, we had to cancel it. So I just want to make clear that it's not allowed to film inside here. Uh, If you, if you want to take photos or you know, tweet or put things in Facebook, that's okay, but we're not allow allowing live stream here. Um, so thank you again. Um, my name is Diana Negrin. I am a geographer. Uh, I am currently a part of the Drugs, Politics, and Culture Collective that uh, Bia Labachi and Nidia Olvera um, co-founded co, uh, and um, I, I feel very grateful uh, for this friendship and this collegiality that we've been able to form because it's really, um, I grew up around psychedelic science because of my parents being, I'm a second generation mm, researcher in these respects. And it's been a very, uh, north of the border, it's, it's often been a very um, small circle of people. And I think that we're, with this new boom in psychedelics, we're starting to see, to some extent, an expansion, a more critical perspective on the you know, political ecology, political economy, uh, the cultural impacts uh, that this boom in psych psychedelics can have both for um, consumers, but also for the peoples and the territories that have historically um, used these plants. And so I see that there's been a progression, um, you know, from the MAPS conferences to this really fantastic conference that uh, BIA organized in Mexico earlier this year on sacred plants in the Americas. There's this opening where we're, talk we're, we're being more interdisciplinary, um, less white, um, multilingual, and, um, and I think that this is a good direction to be going in. And so I'm really happy to be moderating this first panel that that will bring three really critical perspectives to um, the study of psychedelics. Um, so I wanted to, I'm going to introduce the three panelists and, oh, you're the first, well, I just, oh, okay, so, sorry, I misunderstood that maybe you weren't going to, so the four, the four panelists, um, and then we'll go in that particular order. So Bia, you'll be first. Okay, so Via Lavachi, I'm not sure if she needs an introduction. Does she? Yes, okay. So Via Lavachi is an anthropologist from Brazil. Uh, she has spent a number of, wow, many, many years uh, researching ayahuasca and more recently researching peyote. She has authored and co-authored a number of really fantastic books 
on ayahuasca, on peyote, on different elements of psychedelic science. Uh, she has organized a series of conferences yeah, in various parts of the hemisphere. And, and I think for that reason, she's one of the unifying, she's, she's really a hemispheric researcher and, and uh, organizer and activist. And so she uh, has just recently uh, published, along with Plan C, Kavnar, uh, a new book, a new anthology. And so she'll be presenting that work. And uh, then next we will have Nidia Olvera Hernandez, who earned her degree in ethnohistory from the National School of Anthropology and History, and a master's in social anthropology from the Center for the Study and Investigation in Social Anthropology, CSS, in Mexico City. Her main areas of interest are the early and modern history of psychoactive substances and drug policy. She is a PhD candidate in history at the Mora Institute in Mexico, and she is also a professor at the National School of Anthropology and History at the Autonomous University of Mexico City. She is the author of a number of peer-reviewed articles and co-founder of the Drugs, Politics, and Culture Collective. Her presentation is titled Restrictions on Psychedelic Science in Mexico from a Historical Perspective. Then I believe it's Joanna Steinhardt. Yes. Um, is a PhD candidate in social culture anthropology at the University of California, Santa Barbara, with a focus on new religious movements, pop popular ecology and environmentalism, contemporary American spirituality and science and technology studies. Her dissertation is on the do-it-yourself mycology, a moral, political, and techno-scientific practice that combines countercultural ecology and post-humanist -humanist ethics with open source and post-humanist uh, sorry, open source and citizen science to imagine a future built on participatory science and interspecies alliance. <laughs> Her talk is titled Psychedelics and Narratives of Return. Uh, and then finally, we'll have Laura Dev. She's a PhD candidate at UC Berkeley in the Department of Environmental Science Policy and Management. Her studies are focused on the intersection of political ecology, science studies, and ethnobotany. She conducts her field work in indigenous Shipibo communities in Ucayali, Peru, where she has been living part uh, for the past several years, um, part time. Laura is now um, research coordinator for the grassroots nonprofit Alianza Arcana, where she emphasizes a participatory approach to research. She hopes for um, her work to support Shipibo communities to sustainably manage their cultural and botanical resources and she holds an MS in Ecology from Colorado State University. Her talk is titled Plant Knowledge, Indigenous Approaches, and Interspecies Listening Towards Decolonizing Ayahuasca Research. So I want to thank and welcome every, all four panelists, and uh, we'll get started first with Bia Lavachi. Okay, so um, because we have this uh, special guest and in, in, in the name of the collective and time, I'm not going to give my presentation. Uh, I just want to say a few words, uh, you know, regarding the opening of this conference. So the conference is called uh, Cultural and Political Perspectives in Psychedelic Science, as you can see here in my t-shirt. Um, and this conference is a continuation of a work that a lot of us have been trying to do, which is to bring... Uh, other elements to the field of psychedelic science. And in April 2017, we held a plant medicine track inside psychedelic science 2017, uh, which was the largest conference on psychedelics so far on earth. It had more than 3,000 people attending it. And like two, almost two whole tracks simultaneous to the clinical track, uh, to the clinical trial tracks, and the interdisciplinary one was the plant medicine track. And I was the curator of that um, of that track. And so, uh, the objective of this this track and of this discussion inside the field of uh, psychedelic science is to to amplify our notions of what psychedelic science is. So, we're trying to to aim uh, the importance of including different disciplines. For example, social sciences. So, anthropology is one of the social sciences, not just uh, the only one, but it's an important one. We're also, as I said before, aiming to include different voices and different kinds of knowledge from the global south. 
we're also trying to create a better balance between the presence of men and women. And we're also trying to create a kind of meta-reflection question about what is psychedelic science and how do you define the field of psychedelic science. So I just, you know, I'm not going to resolve these things in my five minutes, but I just wanted to put this, uh, you know, questions out there. Why the title and why we're here and why we're doing this? And remind us all that the psychedelic science has been historically always a, a, a line or a fine line between science and culture. If one thinks the very notion of psychedelic was created by scientists that were sitting on teepees in, uh, with the Native American people in Canada, and that's how they came uh, uh, eating peyote, they, you know, they came uh, to create this uh, term, psychedelic, so psychedelics has always been, you know, has always had a mix with indigenous cultures, with cultural things, and with things that are not scientific only. So there's a combination of different elements, and how do we incorporate this in the field of uh, psychedelic science? Also, one might always remember that there has been always a historical tension between clinical and non-clinical uses of psychedelics. So what we're saying here is that it's necessary to create bridges between the humanistic and spiritual world of psychedelic therapy and the objective world of ph pharmaceutical research. This dialogue is important. So this book, uh, this conference is launching a book that was created out of the plant medicine track that I created, and this is the, the book here, Plant Medicines, Healing and Psychedelic Science, Cultural Perspectives. Uh, this is a kind of symbolic launch. This book is rather expensive. It's from that uh, kind of, of publisher that sells more to libraries and institutions and big companies. But any of you that have a genuine interest for scientific, scientific non-commercial, and personal reasons only and can't afford the book, please come to me and uh, we'll figure it out. And I want to you know, just uh, um, remind a few points that this book brings, which has to do with all this general framework that I'm presenting to you here now. Let's say in kind of popular and, and more simplistic way, not everything is about molecules and active principles, but plant matters too. Uh, there are multiple definitions of healing and multiple ways to investigate it. So if we're talking about healing, uh, different uh, ailments and diseases or pathologies, how do we define healing? And what are the legitimate tools to investigate that healing? And what are the substances and how are they used? So uh, as, as you see, it brings a lot. It's, 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 it, it's a wide perspective. Uh, the other point that you know an anthropologist has to make, and it's quite obvious for us, it's anthropology one, is that healing is always something relational. Healing is not something in itself. Healing depends the context. Healing depends on the relationship that people establish with each other, with, their, with themselves, with the therapist, and at larger, with the cultural context, with the cosmos, or the deities, or the visible world, or the larger structures, however you want to call it. So it's necessary to always remind that it's not just about the inherent properties of certain substances that then you know, create scheduling lists of good and bad substances, right and wrong. It's more complicated than that. It's not just about the pharmaceutical properties that are inherent to certain substances, but it's about how they are used, in which context, with which rules, with, with which parameters. And then there's the important of importance of culture that can't not be the cherry on the top of the cake, but has to be acknowledged, has to be included in the discussion. At the same time, we should, you know, uh, um, win the temptation of making this very reductionistic division between indigenous and non-indigenous uses. Like, we're totally different and there's things has nothing to do. We have our own spiritual and historical esoteric traditions or therapeutic traditions that also blur, you know, very strong lines between sacred and profane, ritual and non-ritual. So it's not just about creating a new kind of dichotomy. Indigenous use good, non-indigenous use bad, clinical trials bad, or uh, ritualistic use goods. It's, it's more complicated than that. And this panel brings a lot of this. And then 
Finally, it's our job to reflect on the conditions of production of knowledge, because the knowledge we produce is also historical, and it's also made on a specific social political context. And the knowledge on psychedelic science is, is done mainly under prohibition. So this science that has been uh, uh, born and, 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 and raised and you know distributed is a science that comes with a lot of limitations, with a lot of funding limitations, with a lot of stigma, with a lot of prejudice, with a lot of difficulty in doing research. So the findings that we have are limited. If we think, you know, it's a very big, uh, Catch 22 because you have this definition of psych, uh, scheduled one substances that have no medical use and potential of abuse, and therefore they can't, you know, be unscheduled. They are dangerous, but to research them, which would eventually show that they are not so bad, you can't really research because it's illegal, and so you have to do a big, you know, <laughs> lobby to get the chance to research to discuss this. So. It's important to understand that this science that we're making today has a lot of constraints. It's not pure, it's also political, and it has a lot of uh, limitation. And to, um, to conclude that we also have to think of multiple ways of regulating the uses of the substances, and the role of culture, and informal controls, and social controls, and uh, group communities, and not just official legislation, but to think about how the, these plants have been used historically and how they have been regulated and think about these different modes of regulation. It's also part of what this book and this conference is about. And again, thank you very much for, for coming and for being here, and I wish we all have a great uh, conference. First, I want to say uh, thank you to Bia and all the people that made it happen. Uh, this is my presentation, Restrictions on Psychedelic Science uh, in Mexico from a Historical Perspective. I'm, I need to read the, this paper. Um, in this presentation, I assume that science has not been as objective as has been said, particularly the science around substance that has been banned, such as psychedelics or cannabis. I mean that the creation of science depends on a specific context, including pol political, social, moral, economic, and other factors. Um, to, to explain these restrictions on psychedelic science, I'm going to use uh, two examples of scientists from the past and their relation to government authorities. Uh, one is a Mexican psychiatrist, and his problems with the Federal Bureau of Narcotics, and the other one, uh, an American psychologist, uh, Timothy Larry, that I know that is a controversial person in psychedelic movement, but I'm going to focus in the project that he established in Mexico in 1963 and the reaction of Mexican authorities. Uh, first, uh, Dr. Leopoldo Salazar Vinegra and the marijuana meat. Uh, Salazar uh, was a Mexican psychiatrist, a professor, a politician, and also a prolific writer. His works were written before the psychedelic era, but I consider his work an important precedent. Uh, he's famous for his studies about drugs, mainly marijuana. He was the mastermind of the legalization of drugs in Mexico in 1940, and he is my personal hero. <laughs> Maybe some of you know that or not that marijuana was, for, was forbidden in Mexico before in the US in 1920. Uh, the, Mexican the federal Mexican government published a law that prohibited all substances that degenerate the race, which include opium, morphine, heroin, cocaine, and marijuana. But it was also in Mexico where one of the first decriminalization and regulation of drugs was established. Uh, based on the studies of Salazar, um, the government of Lázaro Cárdenas, that was a president in Mexico who is known for his socialist policies, published a federal law of drug addiction that gave the control of commercialization of drugs to the state, mediated by the health department. With this law, the Mexican state created dispensaries that sell or give free of charge drugs that it has pro prohibited 20 years earlier. Uh, the state was in charge of the dispensaries, more like the Uruguay, current Uruguay model. This law also establishes that consumers will be treated like patients or sick people, but not like criminals. Two years before, uh, Salazar Vinegra published The Meat of Marijuana, an article that had the goal to eradicate some fake information about cannabis. 
and it was based on ex empiric experimentations uh, with dogs, frogs, and other animals. And he used like uh, some kind of inhalation boxes to the dogs, or and also he experimented with people, including other scientists, students, or the mentally mentally ill whom he could access because he worked in a mental hospital. He argued that cannabis had healing properties for asthma, rheumatism, and as a pain reliever, and that there was no evidence linking this plan to criminal action, violence, or madness. He also studied other drugs like opium and uh, alcohol uh, that he considered that was a real health problem in Mexico, and benzedrine, an amphetamine that he believed could be useful to increase mental performance and potentially had other applications for neuropsychiatry. In addition, Salazar considered marijuana laws unjustified and excessive, and the drug policies should be based on a health approach and not criminalizing consumers. He believed that the only way to make power from drug traffickers was to decriminalize and regulate substance. His research had great influence and brought out about this historical moment in 1940s in Mexico when drugs were legalized. But the ideas of Leopoldo Salazar weren't approved by Mexican and North American prohibitionists. First, he had been warned by the Mexican government that the use of cannabis was illegal even for scientific purposes and that he had to stop his studies. In addition, since the publication of the marijuana myth in 1938, a translation of this paper came into the hands of Harry Atlinger, who was in charge of the Federal Bureau of Narcotics, the predecessor of the DEA. The Federal Bureau of Narcotics opened a folder of the investigation into Dr. Salazar and tried to discredit his research in one of the meetings of the League on Nations. Atlinger and Salazar's position on marijuana were very divergent. Adlinger argued that marijuana was introduced to the U.S. from Mexico and that it was a menace to youth. Adlinger also described Dr. Salazar as a radical in his treatment of the marijuana problem. So when drugs were regulated in Mexico in 1940, Adlinger, the U.S. government, and the Federal Bureau of Narcotics applied similar tactics. Some few months after this law was published, the government of the U.S. informed to the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Mexico that they will, will stop exporting certain medicines to Mexico because there was a high risk of illegitimate and unlawful use. Without these products from U.S. pharmaceuticals, Mexico could not continue this, with this policy of the regulation of drugs and had to cancel this vanguard and reasonable law. And the other, uh, and the other example is about Timothy Timothy Larry and the Siwatanejo project. Um, Timothy Larry has a close relation with Mexico. He liked to visit this country constantly, starting in 1960 when uh, he described he ate seven of the sacred mushrooms of Mexico and discovered the beauty, revelation, and sensuality, the cellular history of the past at um, Cuernavaca, a tropical town in central Mexico and ending on his detention in December 1965 for attempting to smuggle cannabis across the Mexico-Texas border. In this timeline, we find the instauration of the Freedom Center Mexico that functioned, functioned for a few weeks in 1963 at Cihuatanejo Guerrero. After Larry and Richard Alper had to leave Harvard, they created the International Foundation for Internal Freedom, a non-profit corporation based in Massachusetts, but with the intention to have other chapters. The initial idea was to establish a Mexican retreat center list for year-round occupancy. They expected that groups from different locations will use the center for research, study, seminars, and transcendental living. When they were looking uh, for the right location, Larry described his idea and he said, but where to go, like a spiritual pilgrims of the past, we needed a deserted spot where life would be inexpensive and free from religious persecution. We consulted the map and went on the planet with a small group of God seekers find land and liberty. And then he remembered the quiet fishing village on the Pacific Cihuatanejo, that is very close to Acapulco. They chose the Hotel Catalina, located over the hills, in an area is isolated from the village, but close to the beach. 
Uh, Joseph Downing, who wrote a report of the center, described the setting as unique in safety that did not require physical limitation on co or confinement during the psychedelic experience. In May, in May 1963, uh, the Cihuatanejo Mexico Center for Transpersonal Living was created for an objective observation or individual behavior on social interaction, concurring with the use of psychedelic materials. This, the project was based on the book The Island of Aldous Huxley, which conceived a illicit, controlled, constructive, and socially approved use of psychedelics. For this center, the only substances available were LSD and methadone, used to increase the LSD effect. <clears throat> a ban on other drugs was strictly enforced, but moderate alcohol consumption was permitted. The participants had two or three psychedelic sessions per week. The guests had other optional activities like yoga, walks on the beach, or swimming. At night, there were a small group discussions and once a week, a party and, this, and dancing. Uh, Larry described the sessions. Uh, I have an audio, but that's not work. I, I prefer that Larry speak by himself, but I'm going to read. Uh, he said, there's a lot of rain in the Mexican summer. And almost every afternoon, late, and every evening, a brief thunderstorm will pass over the bay. Lightning will crack, go down, and the beach, the ocean, and the surrounding hills will flash into a lighting view. The night sessions usually end in the water as the LSD voyagers will float out to watch the first rays of the sun. 38 persons were resident for the purpose of studying the transpersonative effects interaction with the concurrent use of LSD-25. The large majority were mature business and professional people, all were white US citizens and Protestants. The great majority from Boston, New York, LA, and here from San Francisco. Downing reports some of the results of the psychedelic experience in Cihuatanejo, like transcendental or transpersonative effects, liberation, loss, loss of anxiety, and increased creativity. In addition, one of the main sources was to get half of the group members to express active interest in directly helping to continue the psychedelic movement after leaving Mexico. Only six weeks after the psychedelic sessions began on the paradisiac Cihuatanejo, the center was shut down by the Mexican authorities. About this incident, Larry said, Eventually, this gentle and harmonious way of life came to the attention of the police. A group of people who are not especially dedicated to growth, pleasure, and spiritual discovery. The center was closed and the group dispersed. Immigration authorities considered that the U.S. citizens had a conduct not compatible with that of a tourist and gave Larry and his group only five days in which to pack their bags and get out of Mexico. One newspaper from, Can from Kansas announced, Mexico government has put an end to a curious and in many ways exciting attempt, attempt to enhance human happiness through chemistry. Officially, the authorities argued that the expulsion was for immigration problems, but there were other factors that influenced this decision. First, the sensationalism of the press, Mexican and North American, and there are some examples, like, for example, 20 drug others were expelled, paralyzed laws by the Mexican LSD colony, queer people at the side chick drug center, paralyzed, paralyzed for narcotics and a heaven for beatniks. There are drug others, not wise peop the people from Cihuatanejo. Vegetarians consume hairs and mushrooms in Cihuatanejo. No, that was the kind of message that the press published. Uh, in addition, Joseph Downing, gave a most exotic explanation involving two upper-class ladies resident in Oaxaca, known as the center of the magic mushroom, and famous for the practices among the curanderos or native doctors. Reportedly, these two women were highly connected and influential among the governing classes. They were protective of the native religious customs of the states and were considered that people from from the Freedom Center will journey to Oaxaca and thus accelerate the commercialization of the traditional healers. They allegedly use their considerable influence to get the International Foundation for Internal Freedom group expelled. 
Finally, another factor that influenced the expulsion was the bad relation of the group with Mex of the group with Mexican scientists, who felt that Larry had not drawn them into his experiments. A newspaper said, many scientists are critical of the experiments, saying that they are not conducted scientifically and that the effects of the drug are not well enough established to make it use safe. Downing considered that the view of the academic antagonist developed in the U.S. was transferred to the Mexican setting, where certain academic psychiatrists were seen as an intolerant, self-serving, pseudo-experts who for personal prejudice and out of wounded vanity refused to give a favorable report to the Mexican Department of Health and Sanitation. The International Foundation for Internal Freedom Group maintained their beliefs that the expulsion was because because of medical and academic hostility after an attempt to establish a retreat, a retreat in the Caribbean and Dominicana and Antigua, Larry and what remained of the group returned to Boston. Um, and then uh, to conclude, it's important to emphasize the relation of these two scientists whose research were limited and both have to face the informants of, of drug prohibition. Despite their mistakes, both made important advance in science and changed the history on drugs. Histori historical knowledge has several functions. In the case of psychedelic science, the experiments from previous research, positive or negative, has prohibited important lessons like ethical, methodological, or clinical protocols. In addition to these lessons, history has political functions because it can expose the restrictions of psychedelic science and other harmful, harmful consequences of the war on drugs. This social science could help to denounce, to speak out, and not forget the impacts of prohibition. Okay. I want to mention that we'll take questions at the end of the three presentations. Uh, next we have Joanna Stein. Hello. Um, so today I'm going to talk about a conversation that I had during my fieldwork with do-it-yourself um, DIY mycologists that had unexpected resonance with fieldwork I did over 10 years ago between 2004 and 2007 with neo-Hasidic American Jews in Israel. Um, I wrote this, I made this presentation while I was finishing my dissertation and I was I needed to have a little, basically it's Rick and Morty themed, so I hope that's, <laughs> I had a little too much fun. Okay. Um, oh, sure. So my interest in psychedelics is rooted in my own experiences as a teenager in Detroit, in the Detroit area, where I was involved in the acid techno scene. Um, in the early 1990s, that scene was permeated with LSD, and um, by my late teens, after the techno phase ended, I stopped doing LSD and most other drugs, but I say this because it was informative and it, um, it informs my own interest in this topic. And I open with this not because I think my story is unique, um, but to the contrary, it's the commonness of it that I think is interesting as part of a kind of experimental period in a lot of American teenagers' lives in the post-60s era. Um, if it's not a rave, maybe it's at in a dorm room or at a state park or at a Grateful Dead concert or a fish concert or whatever. Um, so the thing about psychedelics in, in my experience and in my ethnographic research is that they can be but are not necessarily portals to realms of questioning and imagination. By the 1990s, there was a lineage of ideas and speculation that was already connected to the psychedelic experience, one that I accessed fairly easily as a teenager in Detroit. Um, <laughs> So uh, my friends and I read Cosmic Trigger, The Tao Te Ching, uh, Peter Russell's The Global, Global Brain, I don't know if people read that anymore, um, Alan Watts, and so on, a lot of other books. Um, and this was all before the internet was really widely used, so one can imagine what it's like today. Um, this is why I especially appreciate Jesse Jarno's point, that the so-called psychedelic renaissance that we keep hearing about is a rhetorical device. Psychedelics never went away. They just went underground and are now being rebranded and revalued through the legitimacy conferred by biomedical discourse. The real history 
I think, is the more obvious one, that psychedelics have always been intimately interwoven with what um, some religious studies uh, scholars call the fourth great awakening, that wave of new or new to North American practices and ideas about religion, spirituality, nature, and the self um, that arose in the 1960s, mostly among white middle-class college graduates, and grew into the New Age movement, the ecology movement, new modalities of therapy, whole new industries of self-help in the 1970s and 1980s. In other words, the cultural universe that CIS is very much embedded in. Um, so ideas about the meaning of psychedelics, what they are and what they are meant to do in ourselves and in society are embedded in these discourses. And that's one of the things that I think about in my research. So DIY mycology is a techno-scientific practice that encompasses both the home cultivation of mushrooms and experiments in amateur applied mycology, which is sometimes called mycotechnology, like the bioremediation of toxins with fungi. Oh, and mycology is the study of fungi, if that's, I don't know that. Um, it's not surprising that many of the DIY mycologists that I interviewed were also relatively experienced psychonauts. The history of DIY mycology is correlated to the rise of techniques for the home cultivation of psychedelic mushrooms that arose in the 1970s and then diversified and were popularized with culinary species in the 1980s. By the late 1990s, the internet revolutionized this technical corpus with peer-to-peer -peer forums and accessible online instructions. So the famous PF Tech was born. Uh, Terence McKenna found a new audience in the rave culture. And in 2005, Paul Stamets published Mycelium Running, How Mushrooms Can Help Save the World. And these are, oops, sorry. So, um, so DIY mycologists disseminate methods of amateur applied mycology and experiment with new applications inspired by Mycelium Running and by Stamets' previous books, like the one on the left. As mushroom lovers, many of them appreciate psychedelic mushrooms, but their interest in mycology was much larger and more varied. They were and are focused primarily on spreading basic mycological know-how and grassroots ecological restoration. So psychedelics were significant to many of them, but not necessarily the focal point of their thinking or practice. Uh, for me, this oblique angle was fruitful in thinking about the permeative sort of byways, meandering threads of psychedelic influence in American culture. Uh, this can be seen as representative, I think, of the kind of haphazard way that Americans have been doing psychedelics since the 1960s. It's this kind of experimental, sometimes, ca sometimes casual, sometimes very meaningful. Um, as with the diverse archive of resources that I found as a teenager, psychedelics open up portals of thought and questioning. In the process, psychedelics can become caught up in different narratives and movements, especially in the way they mediate stories about the past. So this came up for me a few years ago at the Telluride Mushroom Festival in Colorado. Telluride is the most well-known festival that explicitly celebrates psychedelic mushrooms. I had been hanging out with some of the DIY mycology folks that were from around Olympia in the Pacific Northwest that I knew through my fieldwork. On the last day of the festival, I ended up driving out to a hot spring with a few of these people, including Sam, which is a pseudonym. Sam was, like the others in that scene, white, middle class, loosely anarchistic in his politics, staunchly anti-consumerist, and interested in radical ecological lifestyles, alternative agriculture, and survival skills. As we drove through the dark mountain ro roads, Sam returned to the topic of psilocybin mushrooms. He was critical of a lot of the psychedelic boosterism at the conference. He contrasted this with his own position, as he explained it to me. He felt that psychedelics were being used as a band-aid when people should instead addre be addressing the profound flaws and deficiencies of modern culture. Psychedelic plants and fungi, he told me, were once used within complex systems of ritual and belief in traditional societies. That's what we don't have now, he said. Like initiation rites, I asked. Yeah, he said, but initiation rites in today's society would be useless because, as he put it, there was nothing to be initiated into. Those ways have been lost, um, he told me, destroyed by capitalism, and now the world's cultures were being homogenized by globalization. We need to return to these ancient ways, he said. Each person should follow the path that touches them, what resonates with their heart or calls from their ancestral lineage. I knew from my interview with Sam that his first exposure to, mu to mushroom cultivation was in trying to grow psychedelic mushrooms as a teenager. 
This was fairly common among DIY mycologists, as was Sam's attitude, that psychedelics on their own did not address the larger issues that they felt needing atten needed attention in society. He told me during the same interview that he didn't really have time to do psychedelics these days, since he would want a day to prepare and a day to relax and integrate after, and it was hard to find three days off. This is how I knew that, in spite of his critique, psilocybin mushrooms were obviously valuable to him. He was careful to enclose them in ritualized time and to use them with care as tools of self-work and spiritual development. Mm -hmm. This lightly ritualized usage was the dominant mode among DIY mycologists that I talked to. For example, David, which is also a pseudonym, is a youthful retiree who grew up in the Bay Area and spends his days gardening and doing yoga. His parents were originally from Mexico, uh, and he was raised Catholic, but became interested in meditation as a teenager, and today considers himself, as he put it, maybe pagan with a little Buddhist influence. David told me about psychedelics, quote, I try not to use them just for recreation, but for quests, you know, having personal questions answered kind of thing, unquote. These loosely structured practices lent themselves to a particular production of meaning in the form of self-exploration, truth-seeking, and problem-solving. Imagining a primordial past to which the use of these mushrooms connected oneself through time emerged as part of that meaning over the course of my fieldwork. When I asked David what he got from psilocybin mushrooms, he told me that it made him, which this is in the quote here, um, quote unquote, more receptive to the world, which he explained by way of imagining a friendly plant saying hello. He reflected on how, quote unquote, people years ago figured out which plants to use for medicinal purposes, recounting a version of the ayahuasca origin story here um, as a kind of archetypal scene in pre-modern animistic cultures. This reflective, inquisitive, and imaginative line of thought about people years ago was common when DIY mycologists spoke about psilocybin mushrooms. It also characterizes how amateur mycologists more broadly think about mushrooms. Their interest was often rooted in a desire to figure out how they might survive outside of industrial modernity. The scenario was a conflation of past and future, imagining, quote, how they did it in the past, they usually meaning Native Americans here or people years ago, as well as what we might do in the future if or when modern society collapsed. Of course, DIY mycologists are not alone in these visions. There are um, preppers, known as preppers, or maybe doomers, is another word for it, um, or simply survivalists, are all over American society, um, from the far left to the far right, and rich and poor alike. There was an interesting article in the New Yorker not too long ago about billionaire preppers. Um, but for people like Sam, and to a lesser extent also David, the use of psilocybin mushrooms and psychoactive plants as a means of divination and questing was part of not just a dream of post-industrial survival, but rather imagining an all-encompassing lifestyle outside of, before, or beyond industrial modernity. Um, a central thread in this associative link is the circulation of abbreviated counts of the use of psychoactive mu mushrooms in human history. These histories are often repeated uncritically in, in books, lectures, and classes. Some of them are based on extensive documentation, like the tradition in southern Mexico, um, while others are tenuous and speculative, like the famous bee shaman and the cave paintings. Um, yeah, uh, but nonetheless repeated as fact. These histories allow contemporary amateur mycologists to imagine themselves within a lineage of the bee mushroom, as Paul Stamets puts it as they try to reconstruct an interspecies relationship with fungi. This lineage places them alongside those traditional cultures and societies that Sam spoke of, with their complex systems of ritual and belief, as he put it, that were lost. The ancientness of these ways gives them temporal depth and a sense of authenticity, what John Jonathan Benthal calls in his book, Returning to Religion, a patina, the recognition or assertion of ancientness that creates a feeling of authenticity in a religion or practice. So jumping through another portal, living in Jerusalem in 2003, I encountered many young American Jews who signaled both the trappings of Orthodox Judaism, which is kippot or yarmulkes, tzitzit, long peot, um, and modest dress among women, mixed with the trappings of a recognizably American kind of natural or hippie-ish um, aesthetic and identity. So dreadlocks, um, extra baggy pants, rugged hiking clothes, a lot of traditional fabrics sort of thing. 
This community, it turned out, was part of a revival of Hasidic Judaism that began in the 1960s, actually here in San Francisco, um, and was led by the rabbis uh, Shlomo Karlbach and Zalman Schachter. To make a very long story short, um, Hasidism is a mystical interpretation of Judaism that arose in the late 18th century and drew on Kabbalistic thought. The majority of Hasidic Jews practice the strictest forms of Orthodox Judaism, but the Hasidism of Reb Shlomo and Reb Zalman, as they were called, was different. It was liberal in social values, flexible in Jewish law, focused on the spiritual and emotional experience of Jewish practice, and on the mystical teachings of Hasidic text. The majority of their followers in the 1970s and still today have been raised secular and chose to become religious on their own, becoming what is called in Orthodox Judaism, Baal Tshuvas. The term is traditionally translated as master of repentance, from tshuva, meaning repentance, and refers to someone who strays from observance but then comes back. However, the meaning, uh, I'm sorry, the translation of, I'm sorry, the literal translation of tshuva is return, and this was how the neo Hasids in Shlomo's community understood the term. So as I interviewed them about their lives, psychedelics featured in several of their personal stories. Their experiences with psychedelics, like my own, led them to a syncretic collection of ideas, usually through books. These were some of the books that they mentioned. Winding their way through the American countercultural landscape, uh, they found themselves interested in mystical Judaism and then taking on Jewish practice. Uh, which, by the way, the psychedelic experience was all of these books were cited specifically by different people at, when they were when I was interviewing them. Um, just to explain that. Um, so, so um, their path. Uh, I'm sorry, I lost my voice. So uh, eventually, they became interested in mystical Judaism and then took on Jewish practice, which is Arya Kaplan's books were integral in that. Um, their paths were also shaped by the identity politics and anti-globalization movement of the 1990s and early 2000s. Like Sam, they linked a critical analysis of neoliberal capitalism to an understanding of modernity as part of a long process of cultural, political, and spiritual dissolution as people lost touch with their traditions and collective autonomy. So just to say here, I'm bracketing, there is a lot of um, like political contradictions and dissonance in this culture, which I'm bracketing because it's a it's a whole other topic, but I'm happy to talk about it um, in Q&A. Um, so for them, returning to, Ju uh, but also just to say, so that is in the background there, you know, there's obviously, so some of them um, were living in settlements. And so there's this kind of in the background of this that they were engaging in kind of navigating these moral and political questions of taking part in a military occupation. We'll put that in the background. Um, for them, returning to Judaism was a return to a spiritual language, a people, and a land. It was a way to reroute as a means to reverse the damage of industrial modernity through reversing the sense of alienation from the land and the spiritual emptiness of late capitalism. They weren't shy to talk about their experiences with psychedelics. Oh, I didn't finish. I? That's Shlomo Kralbach. And maybe everyone knows what that is. <laughs> So they weren't shy to talk about their experiments with psychedelics. To the contrary, they treated it matter-of-factly, often with a, a sense of humor. For example, Yitzhak explained that as a secular American Jew in his 20s, he had decided to become a rabbi after coming to, quote, a clear understanding that there was God and an understanding of the unity of creation and the web of life, unquote. When I asked him how he came to that understanding, he said with a grin, Ikitsur, a lot of drugs. He told me later that the LSD um, created an opening, um, a portal, for his soul to find its way to Israel. It's noteworthy that LSD was more central to their stories than psychedelic mushrooms. As one might imagine, LSD, invented by accident in a lab in 1938, doesn't lend itself as easily as naturally occurring psychedelics to the imaginative sense of joining an ancient lineage. People like Yitzhak weren't envisioning a return to an animistic shamanic past co-constituted by complex multi-species relationships, at least not on the face of it. They were returning to a tradition characterized primarily by textual study and by social institutions that are dense with protocol and demands on their behavior and time. Um, so uh, rather, I would say that Balchuvas like Yitzhak um, and Aron, um, their experiences often took on meaning through a version of the perennial tradition, which is the idea that all mystical traditions are variations 
on universal spiritual truths and transcendent experiences. Uh, our own, also from that community, explained his embrace of Judaism in terms of Zen Buddhism. Uh, finding the infinite and the constrictions of Jewish practice was akin to, quote unquote, swallowing the flaming red ball, which is a Zen concept. This was a common theme in their stories. The experience of infinity needed a vessel in the language of mystical Judaism so it could be channeled properly. Jewish practice was this vessel as a quote unquote holistic system with clear boundaries and a conceptual language that gave meaning to these experiences. For Yitzchak, our own, and others, channeling the transcendent through Jewish practice and study provided the morality they felt was lacking in the countercultural, countercultural spiritual practice of their youth. Um, when they saw, which they saw as directionless, lacking in boundaries and in a state of moral confusion. Their pursuit of traditional Judaism was seen as a return to and rooting in this unbroken lineage of Jewish observance. In the palimpsest of texts and customs that constitute it, Orthodox Judaism and traditional Jewish study are characterized almost by definition by patina. On top of this, neo-Hasids adopted conspicuous Yiddishisms um, into their patois of Hebrew and English, giving them an old world vibe and setting them further apart from their Israeli contemporaries whom they lived among, um, who by and large viewed them as crazy American hippies. So, um, so you can see why I felt some vertigo when Sam started talking to me about the need to return to ancient ways, mm -hmm. to follow one's heart back to an ancestral lineage. The whole scene created a sense of deja vu. Between these two seemingly disparate worlds, one bound by a shared commitment to ecological living and DIY science, the other a syncretic mystical revival, there was an undercurrent of similarity drawn to their shared experiences with psychedelics and the landscape of American countercultural spirituality. Both shared a desire to be connected to land within a holistic system with rituals and rites, as Sam put it, to which they felt a personal and effective link. Both sought a sense of what I've called patina, as a source of value and meaning in its temporal depth, its ancientness a testament to its authenticity. And both sought a return to lost cultures as a source of meaning in what they felt was a meaningless world, broken by capitalism and modernity more broadly. Um, back in Colorado, I listened to Sam's assertions with skepticism. Hearing Americans say they have no culture feels a lot like hearing white people say they have no race. Our modernity is exactly what makes it possible to choose a path to return to. The presumption of universality is also modern. The idea that someone who was born and raised in, in a modern world and within a naturalist um, worldview or ontology can simply return to, to an animistic worldview um, or, or uh, you know, to, to, to choose a culture to sort of just take on. Um, because every is is a sort of modern idea that everything is or should be available to all humans, right? As is the tethering of authenticity to a personal experience of meaning. Uh, it would seem that this desire for a return to a meaningful and authentic past within a vision of the future arises as much from a crisis of whiteness in American society as it does from a crisis of modernity and that these discourses and movements are clearly rooted in the countercultural rebellion against the white bourgeois norms of the 1960s. But then again, this explanation is also simplistic if we think about the subtleties. For example, someone like David, who is not white by contemporary racial definitions, but who finds meaning in the sense of patina and lineage as well, that's in, this, in these discourses. As do, no doubt, other people of color in, in psychedelic countercultures in contemporary American society. Although there are clearly distinctions to be explored here in the way that people from different backgrounds and positions in this uh, social and political landscape approach these narratives of return. Um, so just to close, uh, at the time in Colorado, I argued, perhaps unwisely with Sam, I told him that you could never really go back to traditional cultures the same way I pointed out that you couldn't really restore toxic landscapes. That, um, all we could really do was generate life and hope that it would become as vital as it was before. There's always there's always damage, right? And so you can't sort of like, there's no there there, as the famous uh, Gertrude Stein quote about going back to her childhood neighborhood in Oakland. Um, he didn't appreciate my critique and we ended up changing topics. <laughs> uh, returns are never as simple, simple as imagine. They draw new lines of power and asking who can return, who and what and where. 
In reflecting on that night, I think of the work of the anthropologist Anna Singh. For her, one of the lessons of the fungal kingdom is that we are irreparably, quote, contaminated by encounter, a term that I assume she uses with an awareness of the post-colonial association of displacement and syncretism. In other words, life is adaptive and resilient, like mushrooms among ruins and in blasted landscapes, as she calls it, it will re-sprout given the time. Thank you. Can you hear me? Okay, good. Um, okay, so thanks for having me here, everybody. Um, I was happy to hear the previous presenters and be opening remarks because I think they go in nicely to what I'm going to be talking about today. Um, and I wanted to start with a little story. A little bit? Okay. So one of my teachers, Maestro Gilberto, is a Shipibo healer from Peru and um, one of the things that I've heard him say is, Hatibi planta de girao, which is every plant is medicine. And if you don't know how, if you don't know, or if you don't think it's medicine, then you don't know how to use it. Um, but another thing he says when curious foreigners like myself say, uh, they're always asking him, what is this plant for? Or like, what is Bobinsana for? What is Chiriksanango for? And he says, para todo, es un maestro. For everything, it's a, it's a teacher. So, Although he's incredibly knowledgeable about which plants can be used to cure what and how, I think his answer reveals something important about how he approaches plants and knowledge. Since he sees the plant as a teacher, an animate being with its own knowledge, it does not suffice to say that this plant is good for that because of X, Y, and Z chemical constituents, which is how most knowledge that's produced about medicinal plants within the sciences work. They tend to focus on how we can create generalizable knowledge about plant properties or chemical effects on people. So my dad asked me yesterday after reading my paper, how do we define knowledge if it's not something we can all agree on as being true? And I, that's supposedly the tenet of objectivist approaches. And I was like, dad, I can't get into it right now. I got to work on my talk. <laughs> but um, I think it's a good question. So I can't assume that we're all on the same page, but there's plenty of Critiques of objectivity, which is what we learn from feminist science studies scholars like Donna Haraway and Sandra Harding. Um, they say that all knowledge is situated within a particular perspective, within power hierarchies, within a given social and historical context, as media demonstrated, and within a specific type of body. So for this reason, I distrust when someone claims that their knowledge is universal. We all have different tools for knowing the world. Plants, for instance, are very sensitive to chemicals, light, microbes, and uh, water in their environments and respond in visible and measurable ways. But what might they know that we don't know how to measure with tools? Mammals are also sensitive to these things, but as human body beings, we tend to focus our sensitivities elsewhere. Within the dominance of me mechanistic science, we've relied on measurements and tools and statistics to know the world, and then reduce our trust in other types of tools available to us, like bodies, and also like relating directly with other beings, like plant teachers. However, dieting, which I'll talk about later, is one way that humans open, self, open themselves to a greater sensitivity to some of these plant sensibilities. Eduardo Rivera de Castro describes Amazonian perspectivism about the cosmovision of several indigenous Amazonian groups as the idea that our different bodies determine the types of worlds we live in. But we all experience it similarly. The idea that all species have the same internal experience of personhood, but that their external world has different reference points. So as illustrated in the picture here, both of us may live in a world with squares and circles, but what one person experiences as a red square might be a blue circle to someone else, depending on their positionality. And they're both correct. Or as Vera Castro likes to use as an example, what a human might experience as blood, a jaguar might experience as a delicious wine. What one being sees as nature is another's culture. Science for a long time has played what Haraway calls the god trick of claiming objective truth. So from our privileged position here, we can see that um, it's not a red square or a blue circle, but it's a multicolor cylinder. But the god trick is based on a misconception that we can stand nowhere and know everything. 
because really all of our methods for knowing are historically and culturally situated. Science, anthropology, ethnobotany, and academia in general have their roots in European colonialism. Many of the early scientists were sent out to the colonies to report back to the crown about the prospects of extracting anything that could make money, gold, rubber, medicines, from the indigenous peoples that lived there. And these colonial power relations contributed to creating a hegemony out of Eurocentric knowledge systems based in mechanistic science that's marginalized other knowledges and worlds and plants for the last two centuries. So as researchers, how do we break away from these early roots? Some would argue, I'm sure, that ayahuasca research is just another extractive enterprise seeking profits and the curing of first world problems. However, there's also a great capacity for ayahuasca itself to heal many of these colonial wounds and traumas and to assist with the decolonizing of our own psyche. Many of us researching the plants are also intimate with the plants. And I do feel there's a bit of a different value system instilled by the plants, which has transformative potential. And yet, as Westerners, and especially as a white researcher, it's very tricky to relate to anything at all in a decolonial way, because it's so deeply ingrained in how we approach the world and others, and our environments and our medicines. Um, so as we think about how we're knowing the plants, how can we as an academic community refrain from continually colonizing them and the ind indigenous knowledge systems that they relate with? And so uh, just to be clear that I'm, this is a self-critique, uh, that's me there with my tools um, measuring little ayahuasca plants. So perhaps we need to step back a bit to allow the plants to reveal themselves and teach us how to relate in better ways. This may also mean unseating ourselves from a position as privileged knower and questioning human supremacy. It requires humility. It requires meeting the other subject at our limits of knowing and acknowledging that we can't circumscribe them in our own minds or with our usual ways of knowing. And at best, we can only have a partial perspective on the other. Ayahuasca means many things to many different people and peoples. Uh, this is a word cloud from statements made at the World Ayahuasca Conference in 2016 about the nature of ayahuasca. How people spoke and conceptualized it was very diverse, including as creator or mother, as sacred, as a chemical, um, or simply as an experience or a drug. But you can also see that knowledge came up a lot. And in my opinion, plant knowledges are the most difficult aspect of traditional practices to translate into Western frameworks both for dieters and for researchers. And I argue that this comes largely from an institutionalized inability to acknowledge the animacy of plants, as well as how academia and Western culture in general privilege science over, the ways of knowing, over other ways of knowing, leading to scientism and hegemonic knowledges, which seems to desperately grasp that certainty. Unsettling animacy and knowledge hierarchies requires radical decolonization of the ways that we understand the world. When I talk about decolonizing knowledge, I'm referring to disrupting hierarchies of knowing, which historically marginalized indigenous peoples and traditional knowledges. Decolonizing research requires drawing explicit connections between power and knowledge to address the underlying roots of these asymmetries, and critically interrogating intellectual property as well. Approaching ayahuasca research from both indigenous perspectives and plant perspectives can help reveal our human-centric and scientistic assumptions about, that are otherwise invisible. Through interspecies thinking and listening that privilege indigenous epistemologies, there's an opportunity to restore the animacy and world-making activities of other than humans and elevate indigenous ways of knowing. In Shipibo, the, world, the word for healer is onanya, which literally means to have knowledge. The Shipibo word for the ayahuasca decoction, oni, is also related to the word for knowledge or understanding. The type of knowledge it refers to is not the type that can be attained for measurements or even passed down from other people, but it specifically refers to the knowledge learned directly from the plants through the process of dieting. And it's not so much knowledge about as much as knowledge of. It could be singing, healing, ways of being and relating that can be put into action just as they arise. More than other traditions, Shipibo practices surrounding ayahuasca emphasize learning from teacher plants through dieting. The knowledge gained depends on the relationship between the dieter and the plant itself. For this reason, Maestro Gilberto will, will rarely say anything about the so-called properties of a plant. 
Indeed, with nearly all of the Shipibo healers that I've interviewed, whenever I ask about how they learned how to heal, they always mention their plant teachers first. So dieting teacher plants is slightly different from an ayahuasca diet or some other practices that may also be called dieting. Dieting, samati in Shipibo, is a sensitizing time that through certain restrictions on diet and behavior allows one to communicate with and learn from a teacher plant by making the body a very quiet and receptive place and not doing certain things which might displease or repel the plant spirits. Traditionally, this may have involved going to the tree you want to learn from and fasting and sitting under it until the tree presents itself and tells you what is or isn't okay to do. That one messed up. Through dieting and cultivating some understanding in the interspecies connection space between the plants and myself, I have been learning how to learn in a more collaborative way in general with both the plants and human communities I work with. However, the more I learn how to learn from plants and I am exposed to plant worlds, the less I am certain of anything at all. It seems that this form of plant education is more about unknowing than knowing, which presents a puzzling situation when my role as a researcher is to produce some knowledge product. And the ayahuasca experience is well known for challenging people's assumptions about reality. When researchers develop relationships with ayahuasca, they may be faced with ontological tension around the intimacy of ayahuasca and other plants, particularly when these understandings conflict with the under underpinnings of the research approach itself. In this case, they may be faced with either reevaluating their research paradigm or reproducing fundamental gaps between their actual understanding of the situation and the knowledge they are able to produce. So, despite widespread recognition of plant intelligence, spirit, and agency among ayahuasca researchers, we lack frameworks for engaging directly with plant beings in our research. The usual methods rely primarily on measurements, interviews, or ethnographic accounts. And these are perfectly valuable for certain research objectives, but don't approach plant knowledges or worlds directly. And perhaps it's not appropriate for academia to approach and appropriate these knowledges. However, I think that what ends up being problematic is that most often the methods used and the way that we write about plants in academic studies objectifies them and denies them agency, which then renders them susceptible to further colonization and relegates the existence of plant spirits and plant intelligences to the realm of indigenous beliefs and hallucinations. So in contrast, finding some way to engage these plants as living beings with intelligences, with both our methods and our representations of them, invites a different kind of relating. Um, so what absences are created if we leave this out? I argue that what is at stake is both whose worlds get to exist as well as whose knowledges get to count. These are two types of epistemic injustice that occur. First, plants are excluded from ontological status as knowing or even animate beings. And second, we limit all that exists to only those things knowable by humans with specific ways of knowing. Multi-species um, approaches that engage interspecies listening as a critical methodology are an attempt to move beyond some of these paradoxes that researchers face when relating with other than humans. Multi-species studies describe how other than human beings participate in social, economic, and political activities and how their livelihoods are entangled with humans. Whether we are using our bodies, science, or other knowledge-making practices, part of the other exists beyond knowability and is active in the process of generating knowledge. This acknowledgement alone piques curiosity, invites relating, and grants agency to other beings. What will they reveal to our methods of questioning? How do they wish to be known? So why are multi-species perspectives important when studying ayahuasca? Um, when we allow other species to collaborate in the construction of knowledge, and not just the construction of the world as a backdrop to human activities, we open ourselves up to multiple worlds and expand the realm of the knowable. Um, excluding plant perspectives leaves us with impoverished accounts of the world. And also learning from plants offers a form of resistance to ideological domination and hierarchies of animacy and knowledge. Working toward research that engages the many ways that medicinal plants 
relate with humans as teachers, healers, and kin, in addition to as objects of study, can provide different and productive valences to the encounters between plants and researchers. As of now, there are a few examples of this type of work, and it's difficult to imagine research that truly engages with agencies of plants or other species in general. However, my view is that it's a worthwhile aim, even if, and maybe especially because, we can't quite see ahead to what it would eventually look like to have a true multi-species collaboration. In the unknown mystery of the encounter lies the creative and transformative potential. Indigenous approaches to knowing can engage with other than human subjects more directly than the usual research approaches. Shipibo healers, as I mentioned, have a long precedence for producing knowledge in collaboration with plants. Centering indigenous approaches to knowing also allows for the transformation of research practices and can work toward filling gaps in dominant discourses while also opening up entirely new spaces for inquiry. The question becomes, how can non-indigenous researchers engage indigenous ways of knowing in a manner that's not furthering the colonial project of cultural appropriation, nor essentializing, nor ignoring or excluding these ways of knowing from what are considered valid knowledge-making practices? For guidance, I turn to indigenous scholars who explore what it means to work within indigenous worldviews to produce academic knowledge. These perspectives are invaluable because, as usual, research conventions are still not ontologically and epistemologically appropriate to accommodate indigenous worldviews. So we need embodied insights on how to bring together different knowledges and knowledge communities without subsuming one into the other, but allowing them to be sovereign collaborative, and non-hierarchically organized. Sonia Adelaide, for example, an archaeologist, offers the metaphor of braiding different types of knowledge together to create better kinds of science. Kim Talbert cites relationship building as a primary research approach and works towards softening the divisions between knower and known that are so problematic. And Robin Wall Kimmerer, a plant ecologist, reframes ecological experiments as a way of posing questions to plants and listening for their answers. Her approach demonstrates that objectification may not always be required for scientific inquiry. These are just small examples of steps toward incorporating indigenous sensibilities into research. I'm sure there are a lot more. Um, Community-based participatory research is the approach I've tried to use more recently in working with Shipibo communities, though not without limitations and pitfalls Participatory approaches are becoming recommended practice for any type of research done in indigenous communities. And it relies on dialogue and co-learning between the researcher and the community members who are active partners in the research, from setting research goals to data collection to interpretation. And the knowledge produced is often meant to be put into practice by the community rather than to be described and brought back to the academy. How I view this process is that through dialogue, the community members help me understand what their concerns and struggles are, and together we think about what solutions might look like and what we need to know to get there. I then try to leverage my privilege and skills towards supporting the community and accomplishing the goals that they determine. For example, I'm working with the Shipiwa Community Committee to create a medicinal plants forest garden with goals to improve community health, revitalize traditional knowledge, and provide opportunities for ecotourism. All of these projects came about with the influence of the plants I've dieted, and I like to think of the forest garden as maybe our first attempt at true multi-species collaboration. But to be clear, I'm not claiming that I really have any of the answers about how to do it well. I'm just kind of going, learning as I go along. Um, but in, in conclusion, uh, privileging indigenous ways of knowing and multi-species perspectives creates more opportunities for both intercultural and interspecies collaboration. Um, I had the opportunity during a ceremony last year to propose some of these ideas to my plant teachers. And in that interspecies connection space, I asked them if they were inter interested in collaborating with me. And immediately realized that I should have asked them a long time ago. But um, I, I gathered that they were excited about it. And then I'm like, well, so what exactly would collaboration look like for you? And I, what I actually saw written in words across my vision was, we build life. And so I like that Joanna kind of mentioned working toward um, things that give more life. And it also relates to a Shipibo word, which is the word hakon, 
which means good, but literally the or the um, the roots of that word are toward life. Um, and that plants build life certainly can't be denied. And it also made me feel really small and humble at how little I actually know about the motivations of the plant beings and how insignificant my question seemed. Um, and yet, despite human limitations to understanding, I believe that it's critical to learn to consult with and listen to intelligences beyond the human because it's going to be necessary as human futures become increasingly linked to those of other species. And thanks to my supporters, and thank you. Thank you so much um, to all these wonderful presentations. Uh, I think this was a really good way to start out with a, a, a few critical perspectives on um, the nature of the study of uh, sacred plants and psychedelics. Um, so I, I don't know, should we, no, is this set up for something? We just went up and it, now it looks like a big empty space. I'm assuming it stays there as a backdrop. Um, so we have 25 minutes for what I hope can be a robust conversation. Um, if there are particular questions that you all may have for the presenters, please um, flag those and make them as concise and specific as possible. Um, I just wanted to refresh you all on some of the themes that we just saw, beginning with Aukwe's own um, welcoming and the, the book that Bia uh, has recently published. What we see are a series of amazing opportunities, but very deep political, cultural challenges um, that range from questions of geographical context, historical perspectives. Um, I think that one of the things that we, we need to really break open in the, in the case of the United States is to end with this idea of American exceptionalism and you know really try to collapse these borders that include the way we think about history, right? So I think Nidia's juxtaposition of not just a Mexican psychologist works and Mexico's own internal process of prohibition or lack thereof are really important to understand in relationship to people like Timothy Leary who are much more globally popular or, or known, um, but you know, kind of those relationships and how they work across um, borders is really important. Um, obviously, the, the, the question of contestations over the future and how equitable this research can be is really important. So I think Laura's emphasis on methodologies and the types of methodologies that we can bring into our research is key, particularly because many of these issues relate to um, situated knowledges, indigenous rights, territory, and what is very, um, very much feeling like a new wave of kind of colonization of knowledges um, through kind of the globalization of psychedelics as we see it today with our new kind of opportunities and challenges again. Um, so, you know, kind of considering what is the chain of effects of the consumption of these plants. Um, I think another really interesting piece that comes up with Joanna's presentation is kind of this question of what are psychedelics without a grounded culture behind? I think that's a really interesting question, right? This idea of finding one's way back, back to what or whom, how does this play out on the global stage um, is really, really fascinating. Um, and so I guess without taking much more time here, I just wanted to thank again these wonderful presenters and open it up for questions. So I don't know, is there a microphone? Sorry, is there somebody that, or? It's right there, the mic. Oh, so, okay, so I don't know if uh, there's a question. So I have a question regarding the historical perspective and uh, uh, try to face the politically charged uh, environment where psychedelics are forbidden and they have to reemerge as a science and so on. So this is not new historically. I mean, if you look back, uh, cosmology was heavily politically charged. Right? Galileo was put in, in jail to say that uh, the Earth grew around the sun. And it took 360 years for the Vatican to actually forgive, yeah, admit that actually Galileo was right. 
So there is a way to learn from those experiences in other sciences, in other environment, and make uh, psychedelic science emerge faster instead of taking hundreds of years into a more acceptable mainstream uh, uh, way of exploring it. Yeah, for me, history is teach. No? We can learn about that, but more is more like uh, to denounce. For me, history is more to denounce that this uh, kind of prohibition of drugs. But uh, Harald says, like, I think that now that, that this kind of renaissance of psychedelics, they are looking for history and more in the example of Larry, I, I know that a lot of people are trying to, to repeat this kind of, of mistakes. Or, or, uh, when I uh, found this um, report, I think that more like psychologists, or no historians, but psychologists have to read this kind of, of reports and learn uh, about this these examples and how these people made science in the past and maybe learn the good things or uh, not to repeat the, the mistakes. Anybody else want to answer that? Uh, okay. uh, question. Within, within Mexican uh, culture and popular knowledge, is there aware uh, an awareness of psychedelics in the same way that in American popular culture, there is an awareness of them that's mostly still rooted in episodes of the 60s. So do uh, many ordinary people living in Mexico uh, know about these uh, either indigenous practices or the, the wave of use that people like Timothy Leary brought in the 60s and 70s? I'm going to translate translate that real quickly into Spanish for Alcuen y Dianches. So, si, si existe dentro de la cultura popular actual mexicana un conocimiento como popular entre la gente mexicana de estas plantas, más allá de, de lo que vemos en los 60, ¿verdad? Un, un conocimiento y un uso popular. Uh, I, I, in, in some spaces, but for example, I'm from, a, from Mexico City, there is not a lot of knowledge. There is uh, like some people don't like this kind of use of some people think that there are hippies and crazy people but in some maybe I, I will have another answer about because she, she is an indigenous and in, in, I think that in some communities there are uh, knowledge about that and there are people that are trying to rescue this knowledge but and also there are people that don't like this kind of, of plants and the use of psychedelics. Bueno, dentro de las comunidades originarias, pues sí se usa, es un uso sagrado, es un uso ancestral, este, que es milenario, porque nosotros consideramos las plantas como nuestros dioses, ¿no? En este caso, eh, eh, pues son parte de nuestra familia, y eh, más que dioses, pues son, es una familia, ¿no? Es, son personas, eh, para nosotros son personas de respeto, que encarnan en, por ejemplo, en un animal y que posteriormente se materializa en una planta. Entonces, entre nuestras comunidades, yo creo que sí existe el conocimiento profundo de las plantas más que en los mestizos, porque nosotros tenemos un uso tradicional y medicinal de las plantas. Entonces... Oh, ok. So, um, what <laughs> I was trying to write it all down. What Alco was explaining is that in, in the case of indigenous peoples and, and in the case of the Wijarika um, community, uh, that there is a sense that these sacred plants are deities, are almost like ancestors, right? They're, they're, they're animals incarnated into plants, if you will. And so that, you know, more so in indigenous communities than the, in the mestizo or mixed race communities, there is... Um, a very profound knowledge of the way these plants can be used and, and kind of their purposes that, that aren't just as an object, as a plant, right? Eh, bueno, más que en la sociedad mestiza, porque lo que yo he visto pues en nuestras comunidades es que la gente va, pero solamente para 
este, saber qué se siente, ¿no? No van en un sentido espiritual, no van este, siguiendo pasos que nosotros seguimos específicos para hablar con las plantas, para hablar con las deidades. Ellos van solamente a probar, a ver qué se siente y este, a ver cómo los trata la planta, pero a veces esto puede resultar muy peligroso porque las personas a veces ya no salen de ese tránsito. Tiene que haber una persona especialista de nuestra cultura, por ejemplo, para que este, te abra el acceso a la planta, pero también cuando termine se cierre ese acceso para que tú puedas volver a la normalidad. Y, eh, you know, one of the things that she's saying is, and, and I think this is, uh, speaks to Johanna, Johanna's presentation, is that a lot of non-indigenous people in Mexico who try to access these plants do it more so to see what it feels like, um, without necessarily following the traditional path that grounds them in the consumption of that plant. Um, so it's more about kind of seeing how that trend that plant winds up treating you um, and that can be very dangerous because you can get stuck in, as she put it in transit and you don't necessarily have a, a, a set person right a, a, a leader who can ground you and take you on that path and help you come back um, af, you know after going through that plant incluso hay algunas plantas que para nosotros los indígenas también son muy fuertes y que son respetadas y que son muy peligrosas hasta para nosotros mismos y que a veces viene la persona sin saber y lo consume y entonces ya no sabemos cómo, ya no podemos más bien cómo sacarlo de ahí y puede sufrir una enfermedad como puede ser la esquizofrenia. Es algo extraño porque en nuestra cultura casi no hay esquizofrénicos, pero en los mestizos sí hay. So one thing that she, she also mentions is that they, you know, in her culture, they may be aware of, of, of certain plants that can be very dangerous, even for themselves. Um, but oftentimes, outsiders will consume those plants, which are very dangerous, and it gets to the point where even the traditional healers in her community can't help that person um, come out. And, in, and she mentions schizophrenia in particular as something that is not really seen within their communities, but they have seen you know, people with schizophrenia then, you know, have a very bad experience with the plant that, that the traditional shamans, you know, they, they, they no longer can really do much about that situation. Y tiene que ver también con la desinformación que existe acerca de la planta, tiene que ver acerca de si está en peligro de extinción o no, y de qué maneras o con quién, o en qué proceso, pues, cultural se puede consumir esta planta, ¿no? Tiene que ver con el respeto, y también un poco con la honestidad consigo mismo, ¿no? Porque las plantas son muy sensibles y si tú este, no eres honesto con la planta, aunque nadie te escuche, la planta va a saber y te va a tratar mal. Thank you. Um, and, and so, you know, a lot of this has to do with lack of information and that includes, you know, maybe not knowing that a particular plant like peyote may be in deep ecological danger and is being overconsumed, right? Or that there are particular cultural contexts that need to be taken into, con into consideration. And finally, finally, honesty with oneself, right? With really knowing, you know, whether, whether you're being honest with the plant Well, the, you know, other folks might not know how honest you are, but the plant will find out how honest you were, and that may lead to a, a bad experience. Thank you. Uh, other question? Or, oh, and then. I, I'm, I'm sorry, I forgot your name, but I'm reflecting on your conversation with uh, Sam in Colorado, and the, the, the premise that he says, you know, we, we lack ceremony or, or, or the, the means for initiation. Mm -hmm and his idea that we have to go back to a, a previous time and, and your point that we can't really do that. On this spectrum of how we engage with what I consider to be sacraments, you have everything from taking it at a rave or in a dorm room, the therapeutic use to indigenous cultural approaches to, 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 to entering this. And it's a question to everybody on the panel. How do you see the initiation or the sacramental approach to these plant teachers evolving over time. Is it going to be more of the, the, the indigenous cultural approach, a therapeutic approach, some hybrid of the two? Uh, just curious on what you think about that. Uh, 
Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> um, I think about that. I don't know. I think it's interesting. Like in my work, what I like, what I said at the end, that I think it's this sort of crisis of, of whiteness in a way that, um, like, someone like Sam, from my perspective, um, is trying to, you know, find structured meaning and. Um, but I think he also, because he comes from a you know like white Protestant middle class background, that and he doesn't feel um, called, as you would put it, to any sort of Christian like practice. Um, then there's this question of appropriation, which I know is something that's also been a big discussion in the psychedelic community. So, um, so I don't know. Like I, I honestly think it's this open question that people um, that I don't I don't have an answer for and. Um, I think that the hard part is to, I mean, I, I think that um, contemporary North Americans, that I think it's, um, for someone like myself, I find it meaningful to recognize that I uh, encountered psychedelics within a specific cultural context, you know, and, not, and that it's from a secular modern context. Um, and it's from a place in a way of damage, you know, of like kind of cultural breaking, you know, there's sort of, and looking for things. Um, and so for me, that feels authentic. Um, and I think that in a way, we need to sort of recognize um, our thirst for the sort of rituals and structure, um, and maybe be creative um, rather than, I think there's, I think there's a, a desire to want the whole thing you know, to just want to slot into a whole structured world, which I think is what was happening with the people that I was talking to. Um, and I think it's more honest to recognize that um, we are coming from a sort of broken culture in a way. And uh, I don't know, those are my sort of rambling thoughts on it. <laughs> yeah. um. I, I just want to remark that I think that this is one of the hubs of you know intellectual reflection that stimulates this conference and stimulates this you know CIAS hosting this conference as well because CIAS has the psychedelic assisted therapy and research program certificate. Uh, I am a mentor and Janice is here. She is the coordinator of that uh, program and uh, you know. The idea of this conference has to do with exactly this dialogue between psychedelic assisted therapy and the world of ritual, shamanism, religion, and how can we, you know, mutually dialogue and and learn from each other, and what do Western uh, therapists and medical doctors and chaplains and social workers, people licensed that are offering mental health services, what can they learn from the traditional use of psychedelics and and, and uh, techniques and worldviews, and that's exactly one of the motives to do this um, this panel and to open the conference like this. And a lot of things can be said, you know, uh, about like, for example, one founding difference between the world of psychedelic assisted therapy and the world of shamanism is whether the therapist has to take the drug or not, because from a shamanic point of view, it wouldn't make a lot of sense that you give something to somebody that you don't take, because that's a plant teacher. That's a species that is alive, like Laura has uh, so brilliantly exposed in her, in her presentation, which, by the way, is a chapter in our book that is being launched here now. Uh, so if these are plant spirits, they have intentionality, they have agency, they have subjectivity, and they can teach you, they can punish you, and you can learn from them and taking them its fundamental way of knowledge and guiding the work that you do is because the plant is in you and somehow you get that subjectivity into you and somehow you metamorphose and you're less human and you're more plant so that's a big let's say founding you know division between psychedelic assisted therapy where this is maybe optional or even for some it's delicate or biased or problematic and shamanic worldview. The other point is that the issue of set and setting, which therapists frequently like to think as nice music, headphones, uh, thoughtful paintings, and you know, nice environment, but setting is just not how you decorate the room. Setting is the larger co cultural context, and it's much more deep than just having flowers or a little altar or a little blessing. So setting is about 
creating a culture that acknowledges this and has a space in that culture for this kind of practice. So that's another, you know, teaching or dialogue that can be made and in the same line, is there any way that we can bring some of this sacredness or this respect or this solemn attitude towards this plant teachers in the context of uh, clinical trials and psychedelic assisted therapy? And I think the answer is yes. And more than that, I am optimistic and enthusiastic. As a foreigner, as a Brazilian who just moved to the US, I think that Americans in this field are highly willing to um, learn and to hear. And the, I, I have not seen brutal, you know, reductionistic approaches by biomedicine in that sense. I think that everybody that is involved firsthand in giving substances in clinical trials have tried to reach out to, you know, a larger understanding. So I think that's good and we have to keep on making these dialogues. And I also think that's why this conference is popular because people are interested in the cultural aspects that have to do with the development of this field. Uh, Laura, I, Laura, do you want to answer? Or? Uh, I can't really well, there's a question over here that's been waiting. And then if, if, if you want to add or, Just, oh, okay. 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 I can add. Um, Is this on? Okay. So I just, I'll say something quick, I guess, is that, you know, thinking about how the field is evolving or how like Iowa or how um, psychedelic use is evolving in general culturally, that I think everything is happening. It's, it's moving in all directions and, but that a lot more people are becoming interested and, and starting to use it. And I think that the evolution isn't toward like a unified cultural point, but an individual process, you know, and hopefully that along that process, people uh, learn how to relate with the plants and the beings that they're relating with. And that those beings can help guide them toward their own personal evolution of the, of the process of where that use is taking us. And I think that, you know, that's how it's worked in indigenous cultures and traditional cultures that there, it's not been the same for thousands of years that the practices like dieting have been constantly evolving, you know, in collaboration with the plants and with the people. So hopefully that that can happen in, in more Western cultures also. Uh, over, no, over here. Um, so thank you all so much for your presentations. I really appreciate hearing this stuff as a new person, very interested in the field. Um, and also like part of the reason why I feel like I am so new is about access. Um, and so when we're talking about issues of like finding one's way back and decolonizing, um, there's certain people that get to do that. Um, and for me, in my experience of, like, as a person that's descended from Africans, enslaved Africans, and as a person that's descended from Choctaw as well, like, my history has been taken away from me. And the only way I've, that I'm able to access it is by the descendants of people who did the taking. Um, and so it's very hard for me to be in some spaces where I'm gaining information and, like, my ancestors are, like, screaming in my ear, like, <laughs> you know, you don't have it because it was taken. and the route of relearning is through the takers. And so I just wanted to understand, or just get feedback or understanding on um, you all, whether indigenous or non-indigenous perspectives on those of us who have had these things taken away from us, reconnecting and having access to these sorts of knowledge. Uh, I'll translate it briefly into Spanish because I think it's important. Entonces, la, la pregunta de la compañera es, este, el, la cuestión de acceso a estas plantas y particularmente desde su perspectiva como una persona afrodescendiente y de, también descendiente de, de, del grupo indígena Choctaw, que el acceso que ella ve para reconectarse con, la, con estas tradiciones lo tiene que hacer de alguna forma a través de la, la misma, los descendientes de la misma gente que quitó, que le quitó a sus este, ancestros ese conocimiento y, y esa conexión con estas plantas. Entonces, Para algunos es un proceso de descolonización, pero para otros es un contexto de acceso y de quienes están dando ese acceso. Entonces, si ¿sí tienen alguna perspectiva sobre eso. Um, well, thank you so much for the question. I think that that is incredibly important. And the access question, um, I don't have a, like, a good answer for it, really. 
but I think that you know bringing it into these spaces, and I know that there's panels tomorrow that are, are tomorrow, right? Yeah, that are dealing more with access. Yeah. So um, you, I think that, um, yeah, I. <laughs> Yeah, I don't have a solution, but I think it's so important that as a community that it's being talked about and that we're exploring what that looks like and you know how to get there together. So Yeah, you touch on a uh, crucial point and it has a lot to do with colonization and the definitions of indigenity. So it's a paradox because like in the US, some tribes have been federally recognized, whereas others are not federally recognized. And depending on each state, for example, just the federal recognized tribes can have access to peyote and non-federally recognized tribes <coughs> can't have access to peyote. But not all tribes went into treaty with the government. So it's a kind of paradox because you have to be indigenous to have access to peyote or to have access to indigenous medicines. But to be defined as indigenous on the first place, you have you know, to go through certain characteristics negotiations that are not always available for these people. And to prove that you're indigenous, you have to practice indigenous rituals, which you can't if you're not indigenous. So it's, it's again the, the circuit and the paradoxes of the current legislation. And you talk about access, and I am with you. And how do we change access? I, I think we change access by doing drug, you know, drug reform, uh, 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 activism, and we change access by creating you know, a larger set of education because I think the problem is that we always think you know of the damage and how it's bad the drug war and how it's put prison, people in prison and how it affects certain groups sure it does but what we have to touch on is the cultural foundations that stigmatize these plants in the first place because what gives cement to the drug war is a view that these things are bad and wrong it's a religious and moral view that has to do with Christianity, that has deep historical roots, that this that these substances are outside our culture and are outside us. So this affects indigenous and non-indigenous people. Likewise, it's the idea that these substances are bad and wrong and evil and uh, pathological and criminalized and perversions and fantasies or illusions. So. I think that one of the big works that has to be done is change the cultural paradigms that inform our cultural understandings about this. And this is also why we are talking about cultural and political perspectives, because it's not just about science. It's about changing mentality and changing paradigms and changing worldviews and understanding that these traditions, they belong to us. We are humans and we have this kind of traditions and we, uh, as human beings, are uh, you know it's part of our, our 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 presence to have altered states of consciousness and to have other modalities of thinking that is just not rash, rational awake thinking so anyway i'm going a little bit all over the place there's more uh, you know if you look in south america today there's a lot of hybridization between indigenous and non-indigenous this has been very common like in the tradition of santo daimi a lot of indigenous people like the huni queen or the kashinawa uh, and other tribes that had kind of lost or were not so active into ayahuasca drinking went drinking daimi with Santo Daimi and kind of started to rescue their own traditions. There's a big discussion on cultural rev revitalization and how a lot of groups are regaining their roots and their traditions by drinking ayahuasca. And ayahuasca creates pan-indigenous alliances between different uh, groups in the Amazon, between in young indigenous people that live in cities and their ancestors and their traditions. So I think that this plants are big vehicle through which this you know, cultural uh, revitalization and rescue can happen. Bueno, pues este es un grave problema ¿no? de los intermediarios, que primero pues fue una, un pretexto pues porque decían que nosotros este, no teníamos eh, pues la capacidad ¿no? de hacer 
lo, el contacto directo, ¿no? Este, y es parte también, como ella decía, de la colonización, ¿no? De colonizar nuestro pensamiento, nuestro corazón y también las plantas. Entonces, eh, hay muchos, este, nosotros como cultura nos damos cuenta que hay muchos intermediarios, mucha gente que tal vez ni siquiera conocemos, pero que ellos creen por alguna razón aprendida o no, que ellos saben cómo, este, cómo pues hacer este proceso con una planta sagrada, ¿no? de consumirlo. ¿no? Pero, este, sin embargo, pues muchos no lo saben. Muchos no lo saben y también, este, pues cualquiera puede comer una planta, ¿no? Si tú tienes una planta, lo puedes comer y ver a ver qué pasa, ¿no? La planta va a actuar de acuerdo a, a ti, de acuerdo a lo que tú necesites, de acuerdo a quien tú seas y de acuerdo a cuánto honesto seas. Sin embargo, para nosotros, por ejemplo, como mi pueblo, ellos, si tú llegas, tú, ellos tienen que preguntar a la deidad, al Dios, si realmente este, tú tienes una necesidad como una enfermedad, el sabio tiene que preguntar al Dios si lo puede ayudar. Okay, uh, so she's saying that this question of access is a grave problem, and in particular, kind of this question of intermediaries, um, kind of blocking the capacity for indigenous people to have more direct contact. Um, with people who are interested. Um, and oftentimes that is a product of colonization, right? Not just colonizing um, kind of territory, but colonizing people's thought process and, and the plants on those territories. And so there is a really important issue in terms of who are prom who's promoting these plants, right? In what circles? Um, because in, in the traditional way of doing it for the Wijaritari is that you don't just get to eat the plant. You, you ask for permission and you go through a certain process. Él tiene que preguntar si la planta puede ayudar a la persona que no es de la comunidad o que es de la comunidad. Independientemente, él tiene que preguntar si, si, si lo puede ayudar. Si no puede ayudarlo, pues no lo puede comer o aunque lo coma no lo va a ayudar. Entonces, entonces eh, esto tiene que ver pues, con la cultura, ¿verdad? Con la cultura que nosotros llevamos. A veces, aunque ya, si el Dios ya dijo que no, pues, es muy difícil que alguien lo pueda curar, ¿no? En cambio, si un médico dice que no puede curar a la persona, pero el sabio pregunta a la planta y la planta le dice que sí puede, sí lo va a curar. Y hay casos, ¿no? Hay casos de la gente que se ha curado, ¿no? Pero solamente se usa en estos casos para la gente que es ajena, ¿no? Para nuestra cultura... Este, es más profundo, es más rígido con nosotros, porque nosotros venimos de ellos. Entonces, para nosotros es más castigo si nosotros fallamos, pero también nosotros podemos aprender de la planta. Uh, so, so, you know, what's crucial there is then, you know, whether the person is internal or external to the community, really, the... the the healer being able to, to, to decide whether, you know, through that plant's agency, whether that plant can actually help that person um, who's approaching it. Um, and this has a lot to do with culture, and this has a lot to do with understanding that the plant itself has agency, and, um, and, and the healer is the intermediary, intermediary who can determine whether um, it can have a healing effect or not. Y bueno, pues uno puede este, investigar como todos aquí han investigado, ¿verdad? Yo puedo leer un libro acerca de las plantas y yo puedo aprender lo que ellos han investigado acerca de la planta, ¿no? Pero ya si yo lo quiero tratar o si yo quiero hacer el contacto con la planta, yo tengo que ir con alguien que sea originario, es lo que yo recomiendo, ¿verdad? Porque ellos son los más sabios que conocen a la planta. Y ellos te pueden ayudar. And so her recommendation is that, um, you know, everybody can research the plant, but if one wants to take it oneself, that what her recommendation is that you go directly to the source, right, to the indigenous communities, to the indigenous leader who may, you know, who has that ancestral deeper knowledge. Thank you. Um, uh, one more question. Is there one back there? Hi, thank you all for your presentations. 
so much. Laura, I have a question for you. So I, I study the iboga medicine, and I'm an initiate of the Bwiti tradition. We've been immersed in Africa many times, been through the rite of passage, and fortunate to have been guests. And what I notice in ibogaine research is that across the board, all of the published ibogaine research that I am aware of is completely devoid of traditional elements, such as the music, which is critical, according to the indigenous people, and the spiritual shower, and a guided soul journey modality that they do. It's a completely medical model. And I would love to see ibogaine research that is incorporating elements of traditional ceremony with the blessing of indigenous people and see what those results are like, because I bet they're going to be through the roof as far as like addiction recovery and PTSD and depression. So how can we create more of a dialogue um, within the realm of research? And maybe this is happening in ayahuasca, I'm not sure. But getting the scientists um, to defer to and learn from the indigenous people and incorporate that uh, their wisdom into research. Um, OK, yeah, I think that's an interesting question and something that I've, I guess, picked up on about the Iboga community as well. But I, um, I'm not so familiar with that plant or with the research done on it, just to, um, just to clarify. But that, um, I think that's something that we've seen in the ayahuasca community in the past as well, or, or in the psychedelic science community in general, where a lot of the research has been more um, science focused and the science hasn't been um, in within the cultural context. And um, I think like the, the World Ayahuasca Conference that Bio was part of organizing was, um, that was in 2016 in Brazil, was like a, a good, um, um, opportunity for um, a lot of indigenous groups to get together in dialogue with many scientists. Um, but one thing I did notice, like speaking with some of the scientists there, is that they really weren't that interested in the cultural panels, and they were seeking out the um, science panels to talk among other scientists, and that some of them, you know, had never um, even experienced an ayahuasca ceremony before, but we're really interested in getting on board with the ayahuasca research. So I think that that is, um, I don't know, I guess I think that that's problematic uh, personally, and that it, it is an example of like colonizing these plants for um, creating types of knowledge that are then being brought back to, um, you know, the North or to some Western context to um, to treat, you know, problems that only the privileged have access to um, to using. And so, so yeah, um, I don't know. <laughs> um, I was actually following some of the Iboga um, researchers at the, at the Psychedelic Science Conference. Um, and one thing, I this isn't, I'm just an, like an observation about because I noticed that they were they were very science based, very biomedical in their way of thinking, and um, I think one of the reasons why is because um, iboga, more than any other psychedelics, does have a risk of medical complications. There's like one percent where there's um, potential problem where you have to get a person to a hospital. So. Um, so there, so there was a lot of care in their conversations about, um, t you know, precautions, and um, and then the other thing was that it seemed to me just this is my anthropological perspective um, that a lot of them were coming out of um, biomedical background that their nurses or their doctors, their addiction specialists, yeah. because of the way it again has entered our knowledge in the West through a, an, as an addiction interrupter, right? So, um, and it has this very well-documented neuro, uh, you know, neurochemical effect. Um, so they, they're primarily in that industry. And um, although some of them clearly, like, you know, had, had, were interested in the traditional, um, you know, sort of customs, um, it seemed really, like, peripheral to their concerns. Um, so I don't, 
Yeah, I don't know. It's an open question. I think it began is really interesting in that respect because it has such a um, such a specific purpose in our society right now, especially with the addiction crisis. Yeah, I want to um, invite Janice. Janice, are you around? Yes, I am. Can you come up here, please? So, have a more elder women because we're all about women in this conference. <laughs> Thank you very much. So, am I the segue to the break to lunch? Or, okay, that's it. So, welcome everyone. I apologize not being here at the very beginning uh, to welcome you officially, but now I do. And I know Bia welcomed you very officially here. We love what we do here at CIS, and the East-West Psychology Program is one of the formidable programs among many here at CIS, and we've been in business for over 30 years as a discipline. And I wanted to wish you well in finding lunch after you leave here. I have a couple ideas for you. There is a Twitter food court within two blocks for you to go get your lunch if you'd like. Multiple types of food are available there, and it's down 10th at Mission and Market in that interlude. There is a Japanese restaurant and a Chinese restaurant that are two blocks down to the west on Mission. And then there's a Mexican restaurant called Don Ramon's that's three blocks down on uh, 11th Street, south of here. So those are the highlights. If you just want a sandwich, there's a place called Ted's that's really popular in our neighborhood that's on Folsom and 11th. And we're back here at 1.30. Is that right? So feel free to come back early and get your seat. I wanted to also share with you a couple things that I've gotten some questions on and I wanted to share with the rest of the group that we are very apologetic about not being able to live stream for this weekend. We had hoped that our technology would be up to speed. This is a brand new renovated room, although it's not done yet. And we were not able to get staffing and technology uh, synced well enough to do live streaming. So the people who have paid for live streaming, we're regrettably needing to give them their money back. Uh, next time that won't happen. You're the fir first event we've had here in our new room. And then there's been a question about recording, personal recording. The university has a policy that none of our public programs are recorded. So despite the fact that Bia did a yeoman's job, a yo woman's job, of asking us to allow that recording, we weren't able to break the policy. I went to the upper administration and they, they will not let us have personal recording in here. So I recommend, given both of those things, that you stay really present and soak up every word because <laughs> it's going to go by you very quickly. And come back after having a great lunch and it will be wunderbar and there's a wrap up. Yeah, moment. I just Not wanted to me. make sure. Thank you. Thank you for having us, for all your efforts. Um, and I wanted to just get you all to give one last big round of applause to our panelists. And invite people to, um, to visit the tables in the back. I wanted to give a shout out to the Huichol Center, to Susana Valadez and Angelica Valadez, who are back there. They have wonderful um, artwork and information as well. On the MAPS table, there, there's also uh, some really interesting books and literature, as well as the Consejo Regional Huirarica Aukwe and, um, and her beadwork. So take your time, enjoy lunch, and thanks for making it out here early on Saturday. Thank you.